This is a podcast from ABC Overnights. Here's Trevor Chappell. Helen Glad is a, an artist. Uh, she's an art historian and the granddaughter of Norman Lindsay joins us on the program this morning. Hello, Helen. Good morning, Trevor. Do you know what's phenomenal, Helen, as I was reading about his life, is his work ethic was just phenomenal. He never stopped working. And for a man who lived to 90, he created paintings, etchings, um, sculptures. He wrote 14 books, not that's fiction books, and, of course, The Magic Pudding. And he did write another children's book called The Flyaway Highway. He just never stopped working. Because I was reading it at one stage, he would, like, get up in the morning, he'd do a watercolour in the morning, then do a bit of sculpture in the afternoon, then do a bit of writing later on in the evening. Well, yes, he'd do a watercolour in the morning because the light was good. Um, He also would be probably working on an etching plate because over his lifetime he etched 375 different etchings, all of which were printed by my grandmother Rose. So that was a collaborative relationship. Uh, At night, of course, there was no light for painting, so he'd write a book or (laughs) write letters. Did he did he have a like a hobby outside of but with these did he love the work so much that it was all a hobby I guess Well I don't know that he had hobbies I think he had diversions and one of the most magnificent ones is the uh, ship models he built and that was just to pass time he was fascinated by the sea and uh, the ship models took a lot of time and he I don't know he just couldn't stop working um, Helen He's also, and we should remember, from a very talented family. There were so many, I think there were 10 kids? There were 10 kids and five of them turned out to be artists. What did the other five do? (laughs) Well, I think they just sat back in awe and (laughs) wondered whether they could compete. It was a household. He grew up in Creswick in Victoria and they never stopped doing things. Lionel became a a very prominent artist and worked in wood engraving and etching. Daryl became eventually the director of the National Gallery of Victoria. Percy was a very fine um, painter of landscapes. Then there was Ruby, who unfortunately died in the pandemic in 1919, but she was an illustrator and a very fine pen and ink artist. Is that because they were from a creative parents? Were their parents creative? Well, their father was a doctor. Their mother, Jane, was the daughter of a Wesleyan missionary who'd been born in Fiji. Grandfather Williams was very interested in, in art and, in fact, in the 1850s, did a, a, a book called Fiji and the Fijians with some watercolours of the artefacts that he found in his missionary work. And I think that's where they got their interest. And, and Norman tells of being taken to the Ballarat Gallery and seeing the painting by Solomon J. Solomons called Ajax and Cassandra. And Ajax is carrying Cassandra off to God knows what. But it, it inspired him and... Uh, after that, he didn't stop. Did they inspire each other? Uh, they feuded a lot. Did they? <laughs> yes, they did. Um, Norman, Norman was sort of looked on as a child prodigy in some ways. And I think he, because he spanned so many different mediums, he, he was considered probably the um, best of them maybe in his own mind, (laughs) but he he certainly um, scaled heights that the others would have... They weren't jealous of each other at all. Mm. They they just got on with being artists. Where did did he sit in the tent? He was... One, two, three, the fourth. I say in the middle? In the middle. Okay, so he didn't suffer from middle child syndrome? No, not at all. (laughs) I mean, he, he was a sickly child, but uh, and maybe that's what really got him um, spurred on, because he drew a lot, and uh, he observed things. And even when you look at the illustrations in The Magic Pudding, that koala, Bunyip Bluegum, <coughs> looks exactly like a koala, even though he's wearing a boater and check pads. Now, they were, they were brought up in Creswick, but they moved to Sydney. What was the... What, well, they went to Melbourne first, because Melbourne in the 1890s was a bohemian 
environment and they rented premises and often had to leave because they couldn't pay the rent. Mm. But uh, Norman was invited to Sydney by J.F. Archibald, who was the owner of the Bulletin, probably the most influential magazine at the time. And uh, he, he came to work as a black and white artist. What was it? What was the reason? Because we you mentioned earlier that they moved to Melbourne first. Because he moved there with his brother. Um, what was the reason for that move? And was it important that they moved together? Uh, Lionel had gone first, and Norman wanted to get out of Creswick, and the bright lights of Melbourne called. So that's why they they all moved in together. Was it a good experience? Oh, fantastic! Did they do any work? They did a lot of work. They and in order to uh, pay the rent, when they did, they would work for little magazines. They drew advertisements. They they learnt the the skills that were necessary to be an artist. And because when you take a and and then when he moves on to the Sydney Bulletin, was it that he was discovered through that work in Melbourne that he went to the Sydney Bulletin? He had drawn. Um, some illustrations for the Decameron by Boccaccio and one of his friends showed them to Archibald who was very impressed and he was invited. He'd already been doing some work uh, for the programs and uh, invitations for the celebration of Federation. So he was recognised as a a skilled young man and uh, I think J. F. Archibald saw saw the talent, and it was perfect for the way the bulletin illustrated uh, cartoons and and stories. Because one of the the iconic pictures that people w- will remember well is the trumpet call, oh, yes. and that vision, and it sums up not only the Australianness, but it's the that also an image of war that was so important. Well, during the First World War, he was. Um, drawing recruiting posters and handbills, and the recruit the last recruiting campaign in 1917, there were a series of mail outs that were sent to people, and they opened out into a tabloid and then a broadsheet with all you know why we had to fight the Hun, but the the trumpet calls I think is one of the most iconic of those images because it is all that masculine and, and you have the um, that ghostly people in the background. In fact, I'm looking at it right now. As I am as well. Yeah, explain the ghostly people in the background. Well, they're the people that should be um, fighting with the man, with the soldier, and they're standing back. So there's a, a footballer, there's a, um, a surfer... I'm just I'm, and they're all around the ghostly figures waiting to well they they're standing back yeah. aren't they and so they're based that they're saying come come we need your help yeah it's interesting with that sort of an image and at the same time which it isn't long after that he's um that he's writing the magic pudding well he he started writing the magic pudding in 1916 as ah. a bet as a what? A bet. A bet. It was a bet with Bertram Stevens, who was the editor of Art in Australia. And they were talking one day, and Bertram Stevens said, Norman, you know, kids like fairies. And he poo pooed the idea and said, no, they want a story about food. And Bertram Stevens said, oh, rubbish. And he said, no, I'll, I'll show you. So he started writing the story. Bertram Stevens went to George Robertson, who was a very canny publisher at Angus and Robertson's, and said, you know, I think I can get Norman to write a book about bears. <laughs> and <laughs> Robertson said, oh, yeah, I'll have that. And if you can, you're on a, a, a fiver to do it. Stevens won the fiver. The, but a magic pudding... I mean, really, what a, a wonderful imagination to to have such a thing. Well, of course, it's it's a pudding that never ends. Yeah. And uh, and Albert, even though he's very grumpy and cantankerous, he has those pudding owners who look after him and try and save him from the pudding thieves. Not very successfully, but the the idea of replenishing and and it came out in 1918 in sort of October towards the end of the war. 
And I think one of the appeals was it was replenishing. And, of course, Australia had been devastated, so many families across the country, by losses in the First World War. And the idea that something could be never-ending might have appealed a lot. And especially when you take a look at the Depression as well. I mean, the idea of a magic pudding that never ended would have just been a dream. Well, I mean, every budget, I wonder what the first headline, this budget is not a magic pudding. It's a great Australian metaphor when you think about it, not only for uh, the economy, but for the environment. And everybody purloins it. Is it one of those... That's true, too. It's always it's always quoted. Mm. When you take a look at the success of that story and, and the book itself, was it successful from the beginning? It sold slowly. It was quite expensive. It was a guinea, which was a lot of money at the time. But it's by in a, within a couple of years, it had gained the traction that was needed to keep it in print. A hundred years on, it's never been out of print. As he then chooses to do other writing, was he considered to be a, a children's writer? No, no, definitely not. And in fact, after he finished it and sent the, the fourth slice off to Robertson, he said, you know, I'm glad to be rid of it, basically. <laughs> and and that's the other thing. About, with an artist like Norman, once you've done something, you don't want to do a thing, another thing. And, and it was his serious art that he really was much more interested in. Hello, Helen. Hello. Yes, Helen. I have a copy of The Magic Pudding, which I've had all my life. It's very, very, very well thumbed because I just loved it all for the illustrations, poured over those and all my childhood. It was published in 1917, not 1918. Oh, and is that, does it say that on your copy? Yes. Ah, but that's interesting because it was officially published in 1918, Helen. Uh, it could be a proof copy. Uh, does, does it say 1917 on the, the imprint page? Because the, the publishers, its official date is 1918. Yes, yeah, so well, this is 1917. And they had a at the um, Mitchell Library in Sydney, they had a Norman Lindsay sort of, uh, exhibition there uh, some years ago now, I can't remember how long ago, and I went in and inquired about this. Now, the story they told me was that because of the bet, this story possibly wasn't going to appeal to children, that they had a, a run of only a small, a small run, more or less, to test the waters. Oh, a little tester, and obviously they felt that it worked, and so they they yes. did a major pro yes. razor run. Yes. What a great thing to have, Helen. Well, very much so. And first editions of the Magic Pudding are very valuable for the very reason Helen talked about. They're well thumbed. And a, I know a pristine copy of the Magic Pudding, the first edition can sell for thousands of dollars. What was he doing after he he did the magic pudding? What was the, his major? Was he starting to write more? Was he doing more cartoons? What was his major well, work? It's what he was doing when he was writing the magic pudding. I think Trevor, because he was doing pen and ink art. His what he called his serious art. The cartoons he considered journalistic. By the nineteen twenties, he was getting into watercolor seriously. The Writing, he had had a book called The Curate in Bohemia, a, a novel published in 1912. And he, he enjoyed writing. He was always uh, wanting to use words. He was a very good wordsmith. And he, he would just write at night, as I said, when there was no light for painting. Then he was also doing, uh, beginning to really seriously do the etchings. And I think the etchings are an extraordinary, uh, tedious and exact medium. So he became fascinated. And, of course, in the 1920s, you had a revival of etching through the Etchers and Painters Society, and a lot of uh, artists were etching. But Normans were extraordinary. They also, of course, were in some ways controversial because his main motive was the nude. 
Well, you see, he, did he like to confront people because he liked doing nudes? Also, his books were continuously banned and censored. It, was he just deliberately confronting? No, not at all, not at all. And the nude uh, may have seemed confronting, but when you look at the whole of Western art, the classic nude is is revered in, in European art. Perhaps we're a little bit more parochial here, Perhaps the Victorian morality was still very rampant and people were confronted with these wonderful, full-fronted, full-breasted nudes, but they were always um, beautifully done. I mean, he, he was a master of technique. Tell us, I love the story about how he had um, paintings and etchings uh, that he sent to the US to protect them from war, but they had a nasty end. That was in 1941 when my grandmother Rose took a, an exhibition of paintings and also she wanted to look at the possibility of printing art books and things. And America at the time was probably considered the best art printer, had the best printers in the world. So they went to New York and they were then going, I think it was Chicago, to an exhibition in Chicago when they got to Pennsylvania, there was a train crash at Scranton, Pennsylvania, which is Bible Belt. Some of the crates came out of the train and they opened and the railway workers didn't like what they saw. And the fire that had caused the original burning had damaged a lot. Well, some more were thrown onto the fire. In in some sort of mythologising, there's an awful lot of myths around Norman, everything was burnt. That's not the case, but a great number of his very fine pen and ink work from the 1920s and the etching editions were burnt. Is they, it... Rose was devastated because she was the keeper of his work. She was his business manager, his publicist. She looked after everything. Once he'd done an artwork, he handed it over to Rose. They came back to Australia just before Pearl Harbour and went up to Springwood. Rose was shaken beyond belief that she had been responsible for losing this work. And they'd kept it out of the newspapers. They got out of the car and, and Rose said, Norman, you know, your work's gone. A lot of it's gone. And he turned around and he said, don't worry, old girl, I'll do you some more. And, and he did. He turned around and went back to the original sketches from the pen drawings that had, and started pen and ink art again. He hadn't worked in pen and ink seriously for 20-odd years. I love that story. Don't worry, we'll do some more. Yeah, exactly. It was just like the magic pudding. <laughs> but, then, but is that the... Because we talked about his output and his, his love of work. Is, was that his answer? That, OK, you can, take, you can take something away to me, but you're not going to stop me because I'll just do more. Exactly, exactly. And, and I've spoken to artists' mates over the years and I've said, you know, how, how could he not have been devastated by that loss? And their answer is the same as his. Look, don't worry. You know, once it's done, it's done. You don't... An artist doesn't sit back and say, that's my best work. And I think to really sum it up, in October 1969, he did a watercolour, which is hanging up at the National Trust Gallery in Springwood, where he lived from 1912. And at the bottom, he said, this is my last painting. And he died a month later. I think he knew he couldn't paint anymore. With his novels, because the two of them were banned, um, Red Heap was banned and also Age of Consent, how did he feel about that? Oh, he just thought it was ridiculous. And in fact, um, there was a controversy in, in about one of his um, etchings called Self Portrait, which was published in a magazine, Art in Australia. And there was talk of that being banned and he and Rose took off for America uh, at that point and he he just thought it was ridiculous that the morality that was stopping people the banning of Red Heap is quite interesting because it's set in a small mining town in Victoria and it's probably more than likely Creswick 
And the thought is that there were people in Creswick who could identify the, themselves and didn't quite like what happened. So it was banned. It was published in America as Every Mother's Son, but not in Australia until 1959. Were there questions asked of him as far as the content is concerned with age of consent? No, no. Age of consent is, I mean, we know what the age of consent is, but it, it was probably more that it was this bohemian artist on the, you know, beach combing. But it, it wasn't seriously, uh, it was in print. Yeah. Because that was banned until 1962 in Australia. Uh, uh, yes, it was. Yeah. And then, of course, um, it was made as a fil- in a film. That's right. It was Helen Mirren's first film. That's right, it was too. Helen, as I was doing some reading, there were questions asked about whether or not he had right-wing political leanings or was a little bit racist because of some of the things that he spoke about and drew about, especially with the bulletin, with the red menace and the yellow peril. Um, is that true of him? Well, I think what what is true is that he was following the bulletin editorial line. I mean, he was commissioned to do the cartoons by the bulletin, so he drew what they wanted. The other thing is we should always remember the context of the society at the time. The politicians were pushing the yellow peril line and the racist line. So it wasn't Norman particularly, the fact that he was able to um, illustrate what was everybody in the society basically thought shouldn't be taken, shouldn't be forgotten. I've got a, a text here that is also said, as a boy I met Norman several times and visited him in Springwood Convalescence Hospital in his final days and saying how he was such a lovely man. What was his later life like, Helen? Uh, well, he remained at Springwood. My, <coughs> excuse me, my grandmother moved down to live with us at Hunters Hill because she had developed very bad arthritis from printing the etchings. And Norman was quite happy to have the house at Springwood all to himself. He was never lonely. He didn't have a radio, Trevor, and he didn't have a television. But he had his books and he had his art materials and he was very... uh, Certain people were always welcome but he didn't he wasn't a party man at all he, he just enjoyed being able to get on with continuing his artistic work it sounds like he didn't have time he didn't never had time all of that for... I, I remember you know going up as a, a girl and, and spending holidays there and he'd be up very early in the morning have a cup of tea and go back into his room and read and then he'd be up sitting in his chair with the typewriter in front of him, tapping away at letters, doing a watercolour. He just didn't stop. Um, Colin, good morning. Good day, Trevor. Um, any listeners who ever make it to the Blue Mountains from uh, interstate or have visitors from overseas, definitely get to the uh, Norman Lindsay House at Springwood. It's a fantastic place to visit. You could spend hours and hours there and uh, highly recommend it. What is it that's good about it? Uh, the variety of... Um, of well, interest that Norman had is amazing with the uh, the etchings and the artwork and the sculptures and the gardens and the whole ambience of the place is just so peaceful. Um, I wouldn't mind sneaking there and <laughs> not even a place to hide and, and live there for a while. It's um, it just the, the ambience of the place is fantastic and the just the variety of, uh, of things to look at and observe. Is it is it within those gardens that they're, they're within the gardens there that those incredible sculptures are? That's right, yes. Yeah, the sculptures all through the garden. Just the layout of the whole property is very interesting as well. It's a fantastic place to visit. Helen, why is it significant? Well, I think it's it's interesting because he was there from 1912 until 1969, so you had that continuity. And as you walk around the grounds, you can see the first statue that he did in cement, and that sort of leads you up the the path and there's a satyr pursuing a nymph. You go in through the pergola into the the main house where the galleries are and you see watercolours, the the oils, these wonderful luscious oil paintings and then into the exhibition room and at the moment of course there's a magic pudding exhibition on and then you can go to the, the painting studio and see the layout of that. 
then down the hill into the etching studio where you, the etching press is still there and there's a, the whole development of how an etching is done, which is very uh, tedious and exacting work. And I know that the visitors to the, the property come away wondering how this man could have done so much. What was his? What was he like as as a grandfather, but also as a father? Well, as long as you were doing something, you were welcome. As he wasn't sort of grandfatherly, he talked with you. He didn't talk at you, and you just had to listen to his stories about um, the ancients. I, I wanted to be an archaeologist at one stage, and that that really interested him and so we'd have long talks about the Greeks and the Romans and and I'd go into the studio and there'd be sort of piles of sketches that he'd done of models in different poses that he would then use to to do the paintings he didn't actually have models posing all the time for the paintings as they appeared in a certain film Um, but he had them moving so that he could then draw that pose into, work it up into a, a watercolour or an oil. I've got a text here that says, Trevor, could you ask about how um, about Rose's 1926 Vauxhall? Oh, shoot. Well, Norman never drove. Rose was... she As soon as she got the car, which was much easier to get around than hitching up the, the buggy, she was off. She loved the Vauxhall. So Norman decided that he would do... Um, a mascot for the front of the car. You know, the Rolls-Royce has the spirit of the wind or whatever it's called. So Norman did um, what he called a sphinx. It's a a full-breasted sort of posing woman, but she's only half a woman. And he he cast it in uh, metal and it was put onto the front of the, you know, radiator cap. And Rose drove around with this wonderful full-breasted radiator cap, which is also on view at Springwood. I love that story. When you take it, was he much happier, obviously, in his second marriage than his first? Oh, very much. Um, I think the first marriage to Katie, it was somewhat what was then called a shotgun marriage. They had three sons, and Katie didn't really enjoy the move to Sydney. Um, She found that she missed her family and all of that. Norman, of course, fell into the whole bulletin milieu. There was Lawson. There were all these people in Sydney. And he needed a, a model to pose. And Julian Ashton, who was a very pr- prominent artist, said, oh, I know somebody, and introduced her, him to Rose Sodi. It was electric from the start. They were early photographs. You can see them, you know, capturing each other. And the marriage was in a problem. It, it had been not happy for some time. Rose and Norman got together from about 1903. They didn't actually marry until 1920, about three months after my mother was born. But because Rose had this personality, she she was considered Mrs. Rose Lindsay. And certainly from 1912, when they moved to, to uh, Springwood, nobody looked on her, or they may have looked on her as a scarlet woman, but her own personality was enough that she could sort of rise above all of that. And, of course, then becoming his manager, and they must have had a very close relationship from then on. They they did. It was um, combative at times, and, in fact, when Pa died, um, my mother had gone up to Springwood, and she rang me and said, you better tell Ma that Pa's dead. So I went in and took a a brandy to to Rose and said, Pa died this afternoon. She looked at me and she said, I've lost the best enemy I ever had. <laughs> Isn't that gorgeous way of putting it? <laughs> uh, Elizabeth, good morning. Um, I was curious to know whether you've mentioned or were not aware of much about the, the Norman Lindsay Festival that was filmed by ABC and, and featured on TV in the 70s. I remember it so well because it was such a beautiful 
version. I remember particularly Red Heap and I think um, some of the other uh, um, books were, were presented, A Curate in Bohemia. And um, But I've n now done a bit of a search while I've been waiting to talk to you and apparently some of those films have been lost. It's a shame on the ABC, Helen, because this is a very good example of how we uh, use through, I don't know if because of lack of funding, but we basically taped over the, fr over the top of them, Helen. That's probably right, but it was filmed in black and white too. That, that's the other thing. It wasn't colour. But it was a very successful uh, series. It was Halfway to Anywhere, Cured in Bohemia, and... Uh, red heap, of course, and it, it was very well done. And yeah, and it's just a shame that it's been lost. It is a shame, um, but we're we're much better at looking out after our history now than we were then. Perhaps a bit more funding, the ABC won't lose things. We'd, and we lost countdown as well. Yes, yeah. um, <laughs> that that was terrible. <laughs> um, Maureen, good morning. Oh, good morning. I just to explain to you, I've had problems with a paint uh, with water coming into my house i love my book and i have one called the romance of the swag by henry lawson with illustrated with woodcuts by lionel Lindsay, and it was printed in 1939 and i'm a bit they have it's printed on on vellum japanese vellum and it has a full page woodcuts printed on vellum and i'm a bit concerned about I'm, I'm so pleased that uh, I still have this book, but I'm wondering if uh, if I could contact someone. I think it needs to be somewhere other than in my library. Well, Maureen, I'll put you on hold and we'll, we'll see what we can sort that out for you. Helen, what's your memory of him that you like to keep alive? My memory of him is a man who, over a very long life, created a lot of work in a place where he lived and it's it's the creativity of the man I think that's the most important thing to remember that it is possible to do something and and not he he did wasn't after fame and fortune I think he knew he he was well known but he just got on with his work he he, he lived a life that he wanted to live not what society said Helen, it's been a real pleasure talking to you about his life this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Helen Glad, art historian and the granddaughter of Norman Lindsay. And I think from the conversation, the thing that I'll take out of this is when he was told he lost so much of that artwork, he just said, oh, well, I'll do some more. This is Overnights on ABC Radio. It's 5 o'clock, 4 o'clock in Queensland, 2 o'clock in WA News Time.